our God is a great God who created the heavens and the earth and all the nations. So I want to worship this great God, this awesome God who is the God of all nations and the God of this universe. I'm the one who, who asked my wife, Esther, to share, but um, it, it's difficult because now I have to follow up to that. <laughs> so, um, see, it, it's Global Christian Week. It's Global Christian Week, and honestly, I'm not sure why I'm here, but, uh, but it's okay. Traditionally, this is a week that uh, we focus on missions, as many people alluded to. In the past, we've had the mission agencies come. And uh, in the global world, this, this, this concept of missions, it's a little bit more complicated. And I think that's why we changed the name from, you know, maybe Mission Emphasis Week to Global Christian Week. Because now it's, it's unclear, what is mission? Um, I have a friend in, in Kenya. They are sending missionaries to the U.S. because they feel like that's a place that needs to hear the gospel. So that's why it's called Global Christian Week for those of you who are maybe unaware of the change. But um, it's, it's interesting because so often when, when we talk about missions in the global world, we see pictures um, um, about maybe people who are so needy. Now, oh, we're so needy, and, and please come help us, come save us. 
And, and there's often a lot of pictures with children in Africa. If you see the next slide, it might or might not be there. But um, <laughs> no, I knew. Okay, anyways. But I had a picture of actual proof that there are children in Africa because I took it with me. <laughs> Just, but we, again, I think we've been having technical difficulties all day. But you can go to the next slide. But there, it, missions is a lot more complicated now. See, yes, we should go out to the world. Yes, there are children. And, and yes, we need to care about the mission of God outside our own country. And I will talk about that a little bit on Friday. But I'm, today, I'm not going to focus so much on them, the objects of mission. I want to talk about us, about you, the people who are supposedly doing the mission work. So I know it's a little different from how Global Christian Week and Mission Emphasis Week usually is, but you know, they, they invited me here, so you can blame them, not me. <laughs> so again, yeah, I'm not responsible. But yes, there's, uh, before we continue, let's give a round of applause to Esther again, my wife, for how she played. See, there's power in music. Like I wrote, there's power in music. Like how she, she shared, it, it, it's different. When a musician comes up and, and shares something, you, you feel it. it. It's hard to follow up, like I said. There's something about music that I think reaches to a part of us that nothing else can. And sometimes when I hear a worship song, I can't help but, but lift up my hands in, in praise of Jesus. Sometimes when I hear a secular song, I can't help but kind of dance too. I mean, any, any Taylor Swift fans here? Taylor Swift? Yeah, yeah high and proud, that's right. The, like two guys and one girl. But that's okay. <laughs> Anyone against Taylor Swift for any reason? Yeah. Okay, wow, there's actually some people. It's okay, for all you three people, don't worry about them. You know, haters gonna hate, 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 right? <laughs> so just shake it off. <laughs> but um, <laughs> next slide. You, you see, music is so powerful. We talk about music, we laugh about music. Everyone. Guess what? In every single country in the world, there is music being created from that country. Okay, every little community, there's music being created. And, and, and Beethoven said this about music. Music is a higher revelation than all wisdom and philosophy. Wow. Plato, Greek philosopher Plato said this. Music gives a soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and life to everything. Music allows us to express ourselves in a very unique and relatable way. I mean, how many of you play an instrument? Okay, a lot. Okay, good. This is good for many reasons because you guys have played instruments. Also, more people are raising your hands now. I'm looking for interaction. I, I don't want this to be just me speaking to you. I want to have a conversation with you, okay? Nod your head if you, if you hear me. Okay. Just like five people nodded their heads. Seriously, guys, come on. Okay, so um, how many of you have heard at least one song in the last week? Okay, more of you. There's still some of you who haven't raised your hands. I'm seriously concerned. If you're sitting next to that guy or girl, just you know, show them your playlist, okay? They need help. But music, music is a part of us. And, and guess what? There's power in music, in the arts. I really believe that. And music shapes the world. It reaches homeless people the same way that it reaches presidents. You felt it too. It's hard not to respond to music. And I remember watching a YouTube video. There's actually cows responding to music. It's amazing. But um, there's power in music, and, and the instruments, the instruments, hear this, the instruments that play that music channel that power. And today, that's what we're talking about, instruments. What does it mean to be an instrument that channel music or, or anything? I mean, the Bible is full of instruments, actually. The Psalms mention many musical instruments in 2 Chronicles, we, we read about many kinds of musicians recruited for the temple. King David himself was a musician. Did you know that? No, may, maybe many of you do. He actually played, what did he play? The harp, that's right. He was one of those mighty warriors. So he's probably like super sculpted, like the rock or something. Like imagine just like super buff and he's like playing the harp. 
And his mightiest feat, I'm, I'm convinced that King David's mightiest feat is playing the harp, being this mighty warrior, and dodging spears as he's doing it. Which he did, look it up. But, um, but it's amazing. There's this music uh, instruments all over. But the Bible has other kinds of instruments. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, we talk about another kind of instruments. But I, I mention music because it relate, it's relatable. I want, I want you to remember that concept. In Acts chapter 9, it's a different instrument. It says this, But the Lord said to him, Go, for it is a chosen instrument. I want you to remain on that slide for a little bit. Um, go, go back. The question I want to ask is, what does it mean to be an instrument of God? What does it mean to be an instrument of God? See, and, and to answer that, I'm going to Acts chapter 9. So you can turn there or you can you know, look on the screen, whatever. But before that, um, anyone know who Paul is? Many of you? Okay, I am, again, concerned. We are at Trinity. You should at least know something about Paul. But Paul was a missionary. Um, he was also a great theologian. And at that point in time, in Acts chapter 9, he wasn't even a Christian yet. So who was God speaking to? It's actually Ananias. So again, basic hermeneutics for all of you who have taken hermeneutics or maybe haven't yet. You want to understand a passage, you read what's before and you read what's after, okay? It's like hermeneutics 101. So what happened before? Jesus died and, spoiler alert, close your eyes, Jesus resurrected, okay? He came back to life. Um, and, and after that, there was a Pentecost, there was mass conversion, mass persecution, and Paul was part of that persecution. And then suddenly, Paul goes on this road to Damascus, and then boom, uh, this, this uh, light shining blinds him, and then God talks to Ananias about this event, and that's where we are. And right after this passage, Ananias goes to Paul, starts talking. Paul starts proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues like a changed man. He, instead of persecuting Christians, he was propagating the gospel. And he was accepted in Jerusalem, and Gentile mission begins. And then you see the example of Peter and Cornelius. So basically, this story in Acts chapter 9 is at the center of a massive movement of God. In other words, Paul becoming an instrument of God is at the epicenter of one of the greatest missionary movements in history. And that's the passage that we're looking at. Okay, so I'm just going to do a brief exegesis, and then I'm going to have three points. It's a different style than what I usually do. So what does that first say? The Lord said to him, he is a chosen, go, for he is a chosen instrument. So first of all, we need, to, we need to go somewhere. And we all know that. You know, we see all these flags around us. There are places that we could go to. There are places we need to go to. We, show, we saw in the announcements about many opportunities coming up. But go. Why? He, he, he is a chosen instrument. What does it mean to be chosen? It means that God has selected you. Out of everyone, everything he could have selected, he selected you. Or Paul in this case. An instrument, you know, you don't have to know Greek to understand what that means. I mean, Greek is skewers, but it literally, instrument is a material object used to meet some need, okay, in, in an occupation or any other responsibility. Instrument could be literally anything. Instrument could be a guitar if you're trying to play music or piano. It could be a frying pan if your purpose is cooking. Instrument could be a sword if your purpose is fighting. Instrument could be a bamboo stick if your purpose is to discipline your son because he's misbehaving again and getting in a fight with his brother and the bamboo stick is all ripped and it hurts. That could be an instrument too. Or instrument, <laughs> it could be a hockey stick too if you're my Canadian friend's mom. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I don't condone all, con I'm not, okay, anyways. <laughs> Just clarifying. But, my point is, instrument could be anything. An object used to carry out some purpose. That's what an instrument is. Again, remember that. Store it at the back of your mind. That's an instrument. Okay, instrument of mine. It belongs to God. Next slide. To, to what? To carry my name. To carry God's name. To represent God. Before what? Before Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. And that's significant. Because that first, it's saying that it's from the lowest strands of society to the highest, even kings. And, and, and it's from people of your own culture to those in the most remote parts of the planet, everyone. So Paul, right here when God is calling him, he, 
Paul is being called to be God's instrument to everyone, to the entire world. Already Paul was a global Christian, or being called to be a global Christian anyway. And let's continue. Um, there's verse 16. I'm not going to dwell too long on that. But it says, but I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And um, see, sometimes I, I like to share that first because verse 15 is about, okay, let's be an instrument of God. We're going to be used by God mightily. But we don't talk about the suffering passage. See, um, when a person is used by God a lot, some kind of suffering and persecution is unavoidable. You cannot have results without effort. You cannot have glory without, without sacrifice. And you cannot have mission without weakness. And I'm convinced of that. But We'll talk more about that on Friday when I get a lot more specific. Today is more about giving you the big picture. Today, again, we're not talking about them, the objects of mission. We're talking about us, you, in this room, the people who are doing it. So it's different. So what does it mean to be an instrument of God in light of all that? I have three, three points that I got from this passage and I think all of them are relevant to answer this question of what it means to be an instrument of God. Number one, and remember this, and you can write this down, and you'll get uh, brownie points in my book. I don't actually have a book. In fact, I don't write anymore. I just type things here. Anyways, but you get brownie points if you write notes. Um, point number one, do you praise the piano or the pianist? Again, do you praise the piano or the pianist? This should be fairly obvious, but we don't think about it. See, the glory should go to the pianist, to the one who plays the beautiful notes. And again, I'm using an analogy here. Sometimes my wife tells me, don't use so many analogies, it's confusing, so I'm going to try to make it real simple. But um, the piano is the instrument, right? And that's us. We are the piano. The pianist is the musician, and that's God. Do you praise the piano, us, or the pianist? God. That's the question. And any, any thoughts? The pianist, yes. See, when, when Esther played, when she got up, I, what were you thinking? Were you thinking, wow, that is an amazing piano. How can, no, you're saying, wow, she's really good at that thing. You immediately, your focus goes to the pianist. It's obvious, okay? We don't think about it, but it's obvious. But um, here, here's another example. I actually learned something just so I can demonstrate for you today. But, um, hmm. Okay. Everyone, this is, um, this is a very popular song, so I'm told, at the Trinity undergrad. So it's, um, yeah, you guys should know it. You can sing along. Come on. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes! Okay. Good job, got a Trinity job. Woo! Thank you, thank you, thank you. See, the applause goes to the piano. But um, here's my wife playing the classical piece. Okay. Where's that from? List. That's list, you know, with a, a S and Z in it. But, um, but that's very different, okay? You know, Baby Shark versus List, the classical piece. <laughs> so that goes. But again, regardless of which one, you were praising the pianist, the person performing the piece. That is obvious to us. So the same thing with us. If... If you are an instrument of God, that means he's the musician. Who gets the applause? Who gets the praise? Think about that. When you do something well, what, where does the spotlight go to? That's important. Because as an instrument, the spotlight should go to whatever musician is wielding us. But it's often not like that. And sometimes it's our fault, sometimes it's not. I get it. But it, the, the idea is that we, when, when Esther played, you were applauding her skill, 
her hard work. She's been playing since she was four years old. And the way she was able to make those beautiful sounds come out of the instrument. And we all know that apart from the musician, an instrument can do nothing. Sounds familiar, isn't it? Apart from me, you can do nothing. See, here's what I want you to remember. When, when you do something well next time, make sure God gets the credit. Okay, I know it may be difficult, but just try to give the credit and the glory to God when something happens. And that's the first thing we need to remember, to be an instrument of God for the nations or for whatever purposes. I won't be labored at that point. Point number two, who is your musician? And that's important. That's important. Who is playing your notes? Who is controlling your life? And I'm convinced that we are all an instrument. If God is not playing your tune, then who is? That's a scary thought, isn't it? If God is not directing your life, then who is? Yourself? The Bible doesn't say that. It says that we're all masters. We're, 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 uh, there's a master over every one of us. So what motivates you to get up in the morning? School, grades, etc.? I mean, don't get me wrong. You, I'm here because I believe in you guys. I'm here because I think you are a wonderful in- instrument. But you have to get the right musician to make melody from you. Depending on who's playing you, different sounds come out. People can tell, trust me. On the piano just now, depending on who's playing, me or my wife, it was obvious. You can close your eyes and you can hear who's playing. It's obviously there's some guy who just went on YouTube to learn something, Baby Shark. And then there's a classical pianist. It's, it's obvious people can tell who your musician is. So let me ask you, when people look at your life, what do they see? When people look at your life, what do they hear? That's important. And and we have all these flags around us. But one of my greatest fears is that some of us, and speaking to the Christians in the room, we go out. We claim to represent uh, Jesus. But then the people look at us, they see our example. And then they say, if that's Christianity, I don't want any part of that. I hope that's not you, but that's happened to me. And I'm ashamed to admit that. And before I was even Christian, I didn't grow up in a Christian family. I didn't want to be Christian for so many years because I looked at these so-called missionary kids. And I saw how they acted. And I thought, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't want any part of it. So who is your musician? What does your life look like? What does your... How does it sound? Because people can hear it. So Christians, be, don't, be, be someone who is a good representative of God. Ask who you're living for. Ask what you're living for. Ask, ask about your dream, that, that dream, that vision in your mind, something you want to achieve. Is it the American dream? Is it to get a good job? Or is it a kingdom dream? We only get one life. And I had this quote from C.T. Studd. But um, only one life to soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So, non-Christians now. Um, Ask yourself this. Some of you aren't even sure about this Christian thing. And I know, I can tell looking at the room, some of you, you're not sure about the Christian thing. Yeah, you're here at Trinity, but you got a lot of questions about Jesus, faith, the historical accuracy of the Bible, relevance of the church. As, um, go back a few more slides. But relevance of the church, etc. That's okay. Questions are good. Keep asking them. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I had Buddhism and folk religion. That's why I'm studying folk religion in my PhD now. Because I grew up like that. My grandma is still like that. And many of my aunts and uncles. I ask tons of questions. I had questions about dinosaurs. And some people laugh. It's, they're serious. Like, how do you reconcile dinosaurs with, you know, all this? It's, what? I mean, I have all these questions. And, and, and sometimes I feel like in a community like this, we're afraid to ask those questions. I went to Georgia Tech for computer engineering, so it was actually normal to ask questions like that. But maybe not here. But I want you to be bold. I want to encourage you. If you are one of those people, just Keep asking those questions. It's okay to be unsure because by asking questions, you strengthen whatever you believe. And that's how I got to where I am today. I asked question after question until I realized Christianity provides the best answers by far of anything that I've sought after. 
So if you ask lots of questions, let me ask you something too. Have you found your purpose in life yet? Have you found that one thing that really excites you? See, before I found Christ, my life wasn't, wasn't horrible, but it was all right. But there were many nights when I thought, what happens when I die? If this is all life is, that's it for life. I mean, is this all life is? Just you know, going, waking up, doing homework, and then getting a job. Is there more? I felt like there's something I'm missing. I felt like there could be more to life. So when I decided to finally let Jesus be my musician, and everything changed. Not all at once, but slowly. And especially when I decided to commit my life to Jesus, I you know, finally realized one day, you know, I'm not going to live my life just on the air, just coasting through life. If I'm committing to something, I'm going to commit. Whether it's committing to, you know, eating as much as I can for a buffet, I'm going to commit. I'm going to eat six, seven plates. I'm going to, like, be a glutton for that day. <laughs> no, but it's good to commit. Whether it, you know, for those of you who do sports, you know, you commit your 100% to that game. doesn't matter. You, you run. You, you go as hard as you can. It's, you commit to that class you're doing. You commit to that presentation. It's good to commit. You commit to that boy or girl. I hope you do. If you don't, that's another session right there. <laughs> Committing to something is important. So when I decided to commit to Jesus finally, not just this like, you know, whatever, but really committed to him, life took a dramatic turn. I decided to try letting God direct my life and my wherever I'm going to go instead of me directing my life. I had a, you know, they say the average salary for a computer engineer out of Georgia Tech back in, well, a long time ago <laughs> is uh, 60000 okay? That's more than a decade ago, 60000 I don't know what it is now. But I said, you know, God, I'm going to let you direct my life. I had no idea what that would look like at first. Okay, maybe, I don't know, street evangelist because I like that youth pastor somewhere. But I never imagined that I would be doing what I am today, traveling to dozens of countries across four continents, speaking to tens of thousands of people. And that's what we've done, my wife and I. We've traveled to all these places, and, and I've spoken at so many places. I, I know how the soundboard works now. I know, like, this is, this is great. I mean, we've had the PowerPoint just shut down in the middle. And actually, we've had places with no PowerPoint at all, so this, even having something's great. But I've traveled around, and God's opened up my, my world. God has allowed me to speak to indigenous churches in Taiwan, to super secular schools in Scotland, to drug rehab centers in Canada, and to church planting conferences in Kenya. God has used me more than I thought was possible. See, I'm actually afraid to speak. My wife can attest to how nervous I was before today. English isn't even my first language. It's not even my second language. But I'm here today. And see, that's the thing. When, when we decide to commit our lives to God, to let Him use us somehow, things change. The glory, glory shouldn't go to us. It should go to God. So, I'm going to skip this story, but um, I just want you to know that it doesn't matter where you are right now. You don't have to be perfect to come to Christ. You can't be a broken instrument with lots of jagged edges, and that's okay. Don't, under, under, don't underestimate what a skilled musician can do with a bad instrument. God is the best musician there is. So will you come to Him? Let Him use you and see what He can accomplish through you. And now I'll, I'll just close with this because we're... I think that's enough for today. But God has chosen you as his instrument to rouse a dead world. Through you, he can play the kind of music that is more powerful than words alone can do. You are God's music to a world. You are what people hear. Whether you like it or not, if you are a Christian, you are representing God. When people look at you, they are seeing God. So before you even think about going out to the nations, ask yourself, what are you representing? How are you representing it? Really, really have some um, self-awareness in that aspect. I need that too. And again, Friday we'll talk about more, more things than this, more practical things about the nations and what it's like out there. But today I just really want you to have some introspection. 
And despite all the theologies that scholars write, it is the music showing you and me that the world sees and hears. And that's what makes global impact. So Acts chapter 9 says this, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. The apostle Paul was the instrument of God to carry his name to the entire world, including you and me. So I'm wondering who the next apostle Paul in this room is. How will you let God use you? Despite how you are, despite whatever, you, you can be just a normal piano, but if God is the one playing that piano, you're going to sound amazing. You're going to sound beautiful. You're going to be beautiful. So be that kind of person. Be that kind of Christian. And if you're not even there yet, come to God and see what he can do with you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time we get to share, time we get to really look to you and, and offer our lives as a sacrifice, saying please use us how you will. We thank you, Lord, for, for listening to our prayers. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done and everything you will do through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.